Ladies and gentlemen, thrilled to have you here for another epic debate. This is going to be a great one, folks, and want to let you know if it's your first time here at Modern Day Debate, I'm your host, James Coons, and we host debates on science, religion, and politics. And we are a neutral platform, so we have no positions ourselves. We leave that to the debaters to make their case, and then for you, the audience, to decide which case was most persuasive. Also want to let you know, no matter what walk of life you're from, we do hope you feel welcome here. And want to let you know, if you're like us, if you're kind of sick in the head and you like juicy, controversial debates, want to remind you to hit that subscribe button as we have many more controversial and fun debates to come. So, for example, you'll see at the bottom right of your screen, that debate will be starring Matt Dillahunty and Dr. Josh Bowen against Stuart and Cliff Nettle, and they'll be debating biblical slavery. So that should be an epic one this month. And also, a couple of housekeeping type things. Want to say thank you so much, folks. We are thrilled. Thank you for all of the people who have pledged to the Kickstarter to help us kind of take these bigger leaps and bounds as we are trying to start 2021 right. And so we appreciate everybody's support and encouragement in all the different ways you give it. Thank you, everybody, so much for helping make this happen. And with that... Want to talk about tonight's debate. The format is basically going to be 15-minute openings followed by 10-minute rebuttals, 10-minute cross-exams, one in either, or I should say both, one in each direction, followed by five-minute closings and 30 minutes of Q&A. So if you're one of those people that pledged to ask a question, please do submit that either through the live chat right now, or if you want, you can do it through the Kickstarter inbox page, and we will add that to the list and read those at the end. With that, we're going to introduce our speakers. We are thrilled for this, and so we're going to start with Mike Jones, who will also be starting for the actual debate in terms of his opening statement. But first, just want to say welcome, Michael Jones, for being here. We're thrilled to have you. And also, folks, both of our guests are linked in the description. So if you'd like to learn more about our guests, learn more about their arguments or ideas, you certainly can. And Mike Jones, what can people expect to find at your link in the description? Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me back. Yeah, I, I run Inspiring Philosophy. Uh, I do a lot of videos, uh, animation, graphic-driven videos defending Christianity and uh, biblical worldview. I also do videos defending uh, theistic evolutionist uh, uh, take on the Bible. So I, uh, I have a lot of various different topics around mostly those two types of things. You bet. Well, thank you very much. And first time here, I would say one of the first kind of apologetics, you could say uh, religion, atheism types of books that I read have from were from Dr. Michael Shermer. And so many of you, I'm sure, have read his books. And if you have not, I encourage you as a very... I love your style, Dr. Shermer, in terms of your writing, and so it's been fun to read your work. And what we want to say, thank you so much for being with us, Dr. Shermer, and the floor is all yours. If you'd like to share, we'd love to hear what people can expect to find at your link. Oh, well, yeah, thanks for having me. And uh, my main day job is publishing this magazine, Skeptic. This is our latest issue came out this week on. Uh, we're a quarterly publication and, and uh, of the Skeptic Society, which is a 501c3 nonprofit science education organization, and I direct that. So that's my main job. Uh, the books you see behind me uh, are from the last 25 years, and so I also write books, and I teach at uh, Chapman University. And the main website portal is skeptic.com, and then you know, michaelshermer.com is my personal website. And uh, Amazon has not only my books, but everything else on the planet to sell, so you can find them there. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, we're thrilled to have you here. And with that, we are going to jump into it. So, Mike Jones, thanks so much for being here. And the floor is all yours for your 15-minute opening statement. All right. Let me know if you can see the uh, presentation I have here. Yes, we can. Mm -hmm. All right. I will start my timer here. All right. Well, hello, everyone. I cannot tell you how honored I am tonight to be having this debate. And I've been looking forward to this for over a year, actually. Um, I've been following Dr. Shermer's work since 2005 when I first uh, saw him debate the infamous Ken Hovind, as we all know about. And I am quite honored to be able to engage with this giant and legend of the skeptic community. So what sort of start uh, sparked this debate was about a year ago, Dr. Shermer tweeted this out, and it really caught my attention because I was about 90 percent sure of the studies he was referring to. Uh, finally, James was able to set it up, and I thank him for that. He's really good about that. 
So if Dr. Shermer wants to bring up any of the studies behind this tweet, I'd be more than happy to go over them. But let's focus on the main topic in my opening statement. So diving right in, I want to point out the topic is not, are Christians dangerous? The topic is, is Christianity dangerous? Anyone can list examples of Christians doing bad things. One only has to read the Bible to know that only God is perfect. But Dr. Shermer has agreed to debate the affirmative tonight, so he would have to show that Christianity necessarily is the cause of the bad things that Christians have done, and I will argue that cannot be demonstrated. To show that Christianity necessarily is the cause of bad behavior, one has to show how it logically flows from Christian doctrine. So Dr. Shermer would have to show something like, Bible verse says X, Dr. Shermer interprets X to mean Y, most Christians also interpret X to mean Y, and Y produces dangerous effects. So, for example, in his book, The Moral Ark, Dr. Shermer reads Matthew 10, 34 to mean Jesus is acting like a tribal warlord and saying he, didn't, he did not come to bring peace, but a sword, rather than metaphorically as an ideological war as most biblical scholars do. Dr. Shermer would have to demonstrate most Christians agree with this interpretation and that it leads to horrible consequences in society. And I will argue that this cannot be demonstrated, as it cannot be with most other ways that skeptics claim that Christianity is dangerous. And also, I need to point out, random examples of Christians doing bad things would not be sufficient. I could find numerous examples of humanists or atheists doing bad things, but it would be absurd for me to make the leap in logic that atheism somehow caused these horrible actions. Likewise, just because an atheist can show examples of Christians doing bad things, that doesn't mean Christianity is the cause. For example, there's one study which shows an association with atheism and autism, but it would be wrong for me to suggest atheism somehow causes autism. In psychology, this is called an attribution error, when you unjustifiably attribute an effect to something. And one researcher specifically called out the new atheist for committing this fall fallacy quite often when attacking religion. So a lot of the arguments uh, one could make can be pointed out as nothing more than attribution errors. Now, I could argue by just listing a bunch of nice Bible verses or nice things Christians have done, but I believe Dr. Shermer and I would be talking past one another. Therefore, I propose we look at this from an area of mutual agreement, which is science. Because the fact remains, numerous psychologists and social scientists have looked into the subject to see if Christianity leads to negative social behaviors or lower quality of life, and the overwhelming consensus in the literature is a resounding no. Now, Dr. Shermer is somewhat aware that studies have found these results. In his book, The Moral Arc, he says that the reason religion is associated with positive benefits like mental health is because religion provides a tight social network that reinforces positive behaviors and discourages negative habits, and it leads to greater self-regulation for goal achievement and self-control over negative temptations. Another form of social capital that can be constructive, whether it is religious or secular. So uh, I could be wrong, but I take this to mean Dr. Shermer believes the reason religion is beneficial is because religious groups create social parameters and good communities that encourage positive behaviors. And the implication is one can have these beneficial communities without the additional belief in spirituality. But the research would challenge this hypothesis because scientists routinely distinguish between intrinsic religiosity and extrinsic religiosity. Extrinsic religiosity is when someone is religious as a means to an end. One is religious for being a part of a community or for social reasons. The extrinsic type turns to God, but without turning away from the self. So one doesn't need to believe in Christ or be spiritual to be extrinsically religious. You are there for cultural reasons. But intrinsic religiosity is when one is religious because they want to follow the core tenets of a faith. One is religious because they want to find God or a purpose is in the sense that he lives as religion. So two important points. One, Dr. Shermer is correct that the benefits Christianity provide just come from creating social parameters and communities. Then extrinsic religiosity should be more associated with the benefits, not intrinsic religiosity. And second, since intrinsic religiosity is when one is religious, because they want to follow the core tenets of a faith, to know if Christianity is dangerous, one has to look at the effects of intrinsic religiosity, because that is how the teachings of Christianity would manifest in people, not through extrinsic religiosity. But when we dive into the literature, we will find that numerous studies show intrinsic religiosity is actually what is uh, correlated with overall quality of life and has been positively associated with increased ethical behavior. It is not extrinsic religiosity. Now, there will always be studies that are exceptions to the rule. Some studies do show intrinsic religi religiosity can correlate to negative effects. But by and large, the consensus in the peer-reviewed literature is intrinsic religio religiosity 
is not only not dangerous, but it's associated with beneficial results in multiple ways. And so I'll mainly focus on meta-analyses, which take into account all the studies published on a particular topic to see what the general trend is. So here is a study which looked at 60 individual studies and found that religiosity is a moderate deterrent for crime. Another meta-analysis found religion was associated with the physical health of cancer patients, functional well-being, and improved physical th symptoms. Another paper from 1997 found intrinsic religiosity tends to correlate with desirable variables like mental health, altruism, and religious commitment. And extrinsic religiosity correlated with that which was undesirable, like being prejudiced or cheating on your spouse. Another study from 2015 uh, found that religion had an inverse correlation with delinquency and drug use. Another meta-analysis from 2000, 2003 analyzed 34 studies and found that aspects of intrinsic religiosity was associated with better mental health. Now, maybe you might think 34 studies isn't enough. Well, here's another one that looked at 850 studies and found that religious involvement is generally associated with greater well-being, less depression and anxiety, greater social support, and less substance abuse. Another met, meta-analysis found that religious priming has robust effects across a variety of outcome measures, including pro-social effects. Now, to reiterate, these studies are meta-analyses, which again, take into account all the studies that have differing results. They collect data from numerous studies, get the overall general trend, thus making their conclusions more reliable. Now, I swear I could just spend the rest of my time going through study after study. There is a wealth of information on this topic, but by and large, the overwhelming amount of research demonstrates positive associations of intrinsic religiosity. To claim that Christianity is dangerous, one would have to tear down these studies and present their own work that shows intrinsic religiosity leads to dangerous consequences. And as far as I can see from the peer-reviewed literature, that claim would be unwarranted. Now, in his book, The Moral Arc, Schirmer does cite the research of Gregory Paul to argue religion can be associated with negative results. Now, Paul looked at countrywide data and claims that the most religious countries like the United States are the most dysfunctional, and the more secular countries display better results. But Paul's work is very limited in its conclusions. Gregory Paul isn't really a social scientist, he's a trained paleontologist, and all he conducted was a simple visual analysis of countrywide data. So he compared social desirable effects to essentially one thing, the overall religiosity of a country. He didn't distinguish between an intrinsic and extrinsic orientation. He didn't factor out cultural differences, political, difference, political differences, laws on the books, birth rates, mental health measures, et cetera. Whereas the studies I cite are multivariate analyses. They factor out these things so we can get a better understanding of the effects of intrinsic religiosity. For example, in his first initial 2005 paper, Paul tries to talk about a link between suicide and religiosity of a country. However, other research has shown the link with suicide is with extrinsic religiosity. To quote, these findings support that intrinsic orientation is embodied with positive outcomes, whereas extrinsic orientation is embodied with negative outcomes. So the effects of Christianity manifest, again, in, in intrinsic religiosity. And that means Christianity, let alone all religion, does not lead to suicide. Paul didn't really differentiate between intrinsic and extrinsic orientation in his visual analysis. Second, it appears Paul relied on a visual inspection instead of using a mathematical calculation like uh, Spearman's row or Pearson's R. And if you're going to do that, you have to pass the normal probability test, also referred to as the fat pencil test. Essentially, you should be able to lay a fat pencil across your graph, and you should be able to cover all the data points to have any sort of meaningful trend. Some of, some of the scatter plots, a fair amount, do not pass this test. Third, from scanning Paul's paper, it really kind of appears like he might maybe he might be cherry picking some statistics. For example, he's got two graphs here, gonorrhea infection and syphilis infection. Okay, but why not all STDs? Why just these two specific ones? This is kind of a red flag for me. He also cites abortions uh, in Europe as compared to the US, but fails to mention that most European countries have actually much stricter abortion laws than what we have in the US. To show how easy it is to cherry pick data from just using countrywide data, uh, I grabbed the rape statistics from the U.S., which Paul says is one of the most religious in Sweden, which Paul says one of the most is one of the most secular. But between 2003 and 2015, the rape rate in the U.S. was on average 31.6 per 100,000, and in Sweden it was around 50 per 100,000. Now it would be silly and erroneous for me to look at this and go, "See, the more a country secularizes, the more evil they become, and the more likely they are to rape." I think Dr. Shermer would want a little more than just looking at some cherry-picked countries and assuming it means anything. Shouldn't we look at atheist, Christian, religious subjects directly, not countrywide data, before we make this kind of assumption? 
Yet a lot of atheists tend to do this with Paul's limited papers. Uh, to quote Dr. Shermer, it is easy to data snoop studies to support one's conclusion or the other. Also, we should be careful with it, this kind of generalizing because I've seen uh, racists do this kind of thing. They'll take data from Europe and Africa or America and then try to show the more white areas are less dysfunctional. And there is no evidence having white skin leads to more social desirable effects. I'm sure we all agree on that. When you just look at countrywide data, you can pick whatever variable you want to account for the correlations. It's not, it's not as scientific as studying subjects directly. In actuality, two things can both be true. Intrinsic religiosity can lead to social desirable variables, and people in dysfunctional areas can be more religious. Why? Well, the reason probably has to do with this article that Dr. Shermer tweeted out a few months ago by Ronald Inglehart. To quote, as unexpected as it may seem, countries that are less religious actually tend to be less corrupt and have lower murder rates than more religious ones. Needless to say, religion itself doesn't encourage corruption and crime. This phenomenon reflects the fact that as societies develop, survival becomes more secure, starvation, once pervasive, be becomes uncommon, life expectancy increases, murder and other forms of violence diminish, and as this level of security rises, people tend to become less religious. So the idea some skeptics conclude that religion leads to a dysfunctional society is unwarranted. The correlation probably is more of a reversal link. People in dysfunctional societies tend to become more intrinsically religious as it provides more hope and comfort in difficult times. That helps to contribute to making a society better and as societies get better, people feel less of a need to be religious. Europe is prospering and people naturally move away uh, from religion when life is easy. That's just a natural tendency. Now briefly, what about wars and religion? Dr. Shermer strongly implies religion, including Christianity, has led to all types of wars throughout history. But I'll argue there's no evidence Christianity promotes war. Vox Day went through the Encyclopedia Wars and found that less than 7% of all wars were religious. And factoring out Islam, that drops under 3.5%. William Cavanaugh also notes that wars that are categorized as religious, like the Thirty Years' War, uh, the, the divisions between warring factions were more frequently drawn on secular lines than religious lines. In other words, there's a lot more complexity with regards to these wars. Douglas Earle did an analysis of medieval texts, and he says there's no evidence the Crusades were ever cited, or no, there's no evidence that Joshua's conquest was ever cited as justification for the Crusades. Uh, scholar Thomas Maiden says the Crusades were in every way a defensive war. And he knows the, the cause of the Crusades was very complex and, provide, and relied on multiple variables. It's not as simple as some skeptics pretend it is, and it's unlikely the teachings of Jesus caused the Crusades. And more importantly, as we noted earlier, uh, there is no evidence intrinsic religiosity leads to violence or crime. Additional studies have shown intrinsic orientation decreases aggression, violence, and counterterrorism. So it is odd to suggest Christianity would lead to violence and therefore more wars. Now, there are so many other issues I could uh, cite. To briefly cover one issue, I want to uh, draw upon this idea. Why are there fewer Christians in science? It's often argued that somehow uh, Christians are holding back science. Well, there was recently a study done which showed that there might be some actual bias among scientists towards Christians. Uh, Christians also tend to be more attracted to helping professions, according to their research. Uh, and so, also, there has been some evidence that atheists can display prejudice and discriminatory attitudes. However, I also want to note uh, that uh, Elaine Howard Eckland did a really more a very extensive survey of scientists in the field, more than the sort of the informal surveys that a lot of, I've seen a lot of skeptics cite. And she found that 65% uh, of all rank and file scientists are Christians. This was a much more scientific approach than what she than what you see with these informal uh, kind of surveys where they just sort of ask people to email them and everything. She found that um, actually atheists and agnostics only basically uh, are about 25, 24%. Now, there's a lot more I could cover. Uh, but once again, if you want to claim Christianity is dangerous, there needs to be some evidence. It flows from Christian, do Christian doctrine. And given the meta-analytical data, I would say this is unlikely to be true. Thank you, and I'll... Uh, Turn it over to Dr. Shemmer. Can't wait to hear what he says. Thank you very much, Mike Jones, for that opening statement. What we are going to do is switch it back into the discussion boxes. And thank you, Dr. Shermer, for being here. The floor is all yours for your opening. Well, thanks. All right. That was uh, very interesting, Michael. Thank you for taking the time to read my book so carefully. I always appreciate that. Uh, you make some really good points. Let me, by way of background, um, tell your listeners who are not familiar with my work that 
I was uh, in your chair at some point. For seven years, I was a born-again evangelical Christian. I took Bible study courses. I went to Pepperdine University, which is Church of Christ School. And, uh, you know, I did the door-to-door Amway with Bibles, uh, you know, witnessing uh, for Jesus and the whole thing. And uh, and then, you know, after seven years or so, I ended up giving up my, my Christianity and I became something of a born-again atheist. And then... Uh, you know, going door to door and telling him I take it all back. <laughs> and then I became uh, what I, I, I now call a, a militant agnostic uh, from a bumper sticker I saw that said, I don't know and you don't either about God's existence. And uh, so now I, I am, a, I just call myself a religious skeptic. Um, of course, I don't know that there's no God, um, but that's not what we're debating tonight. Just uh, by way of background, um, I, I know a lot about Christianity from, from having uh, lived it and studied it. And the answer, my answer to the question is, is Christianity dangerous? My answer is, it depends. Uh, I would say Christianity, like religion, um, is good when it does good, and it's evil when it does evil. It reminds me a little bit of my libertarian friends who debate, you know, is government a force for good or evil? It depends. It can be a force for good. It can be a force for evil. And uh, so it's the actions that I care about. Uh, on on the one hand, you know, as long as uh, religious people, including Christians, uh, follow the fundamental principle of liberty, which is, as I write in the Moral Arc, the freedom to think, believe, and act as we choose, so long as our thoughts, beliefs, and actions do not infringe on the equal freedom of others. Uh, the problem that um, religion has is that it's uh, it, it has built into it, baked into it, as it were. Uh, a, a belief in absolute morality that if others don't accept it, um, you know, the world will not be right until every knee is bent in submission to that one particular religion, at least historically, that's the way it's been. Obviously, Christians are not nearly as as dogmatic about that as they were centuries ago. Um, but that's the built in inherent problem in, in religion. That is, it has a belief in an absolute right and wrong. Uh, a kind of tribal, you know, we're the right tribe, we have the right, we're the right religion, we have the one true religion, the one true belief in the one true God, and so forth. And, uh, and, and the problem is, is that there's no method by which, say, an anthropologist from Mars coming down to study earthly religions could tell which is the right one or which is the wrong one. And so this gets me to a distinction between uh, empirical truths, tr- things that are just true because we can test them and so on through science, and mythic truths, tr- truths that are true mythically, metaphorically, you know, something like what you you get from reading literature, fine literature, like Shakespeare, Jane Austen, or whatever, or the Bible, which is a, a great work of literature, from which you can derive metaphorical truths or mythical truths, and uh, and that leads me then to the distinction between personal truths and empirical truths. And, and that is to say, and this is something similar to, to Michael's point about intrinsic religion versus extrinsic religion. So if somebody says to me, Christianity makes me a better person, I feel better about my life, I have better goals, I'm more generous, cooperative, I'm nicer. Um, it helps me get through the night. Life is hard, and my religion is works for me. That, that's one kind of truth to which I say, good, that's great. Uh, whatever gets you through the night, uh, I'm in favor of that. Life is hard. But that's not what we're talking about here, I think. We're talking about empirical truths. That is, so here, Michael, I think the extrinsic religion is what we're talking about, not the intrinsic the claim that not, not that Christianity works for me, it, it's the claim that Christianity works for everybody or it works in general to make the world a better place. And uh, there, I think it's it's quite debatable. First of all, why Christianity? Why not Judaism, Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, or any of the other dozens or hundreds of main large religions and thousands of, of uh of sex within those religions, you know, which is the right religion and so on. That, that's a kind of a different subject. Um, and so um, to there, to that extent, so I'm glad you brought up um, Gregory Paul's study. 
Um, and, and I did make a distinction in the book that you didn't cite, but I'm sure you came across it, that my citing of all those correlations, that is, the more religious a nation is, um, the higher uh, they have of these social ills, STD rates, abortion rates, pregnancy rates, and um, suicides, homicides, and so on. I, I, I was pretty strong in making the point in there. I'm not claiming that Christianity or religion causes those things. Nobody in their right mind would, um, in social science, would make such a claim. My point in that is that if you claim that religion makes not just individual people like you or like when I said I'm a Christian it makes me feel better it works for me that's we're not talking about that they claim that religious nations that is when most people or the vast majority of people are religious in a nation or Christian in a nation the nation will be better off well apparently not it's not whatever it, it's doing it's not doing that it's not a great prophylactic moral prophylactic against, um, say, promiscuity that leads to um, teen pregnancies and STD rates and things like that. Um, it's not working. Or if it's supposed to, uh, you know, control moral behavior and aggression and violence, apparently it's not working. Uh, but again, I mean, say, say gun violence, homicides, and so forth. Now, of course, it isn't that people are Christian, therefore they use guns. <laughs> the guns are the, pro this is a different debate. Guns are the problem. There's other reasons for gun violence. But whatever Christianity is doing, it's not curtailing those particular social ills. And uh, and, and those correlations are, are super obvious. I mean, you don't even need a fat pencil. You can just, just list the top 20 industrialized democracies in the world and just look at, you can just eyeball the rates. The rates go just sky high to uh, in the United States. And we are by far the most religious of those uh, top 20 industrialized democracies. Um, anyway, but the point is that um, it, it's not working for that uh, respect. Again, you it may work for you personally, but intrinsically, but we're not talking about that. We're talking about this extrinsic, this you know kind of collective action uh, to solve a problem. As for individuals intrinsically, you know, you, you listed a bunch of studies. I have a bunch of studies in there, you know, that Christians are no more likely to stay married and less likely to get divorced than non-Christians or religious people versus non-religious people or, and so on. Uh, I think it's a debatable point, um, though uh, I recognize the power of uh, meta-analyses. Uh, but, but again, even, so I, I don't think the consensus is there, but let's, let's go with your assumption that the consensus is that religion makes people live longer, healthier, they're more moral or whatever. Um, but, but the problem is there is the operational definition of what the causal vector actually is. For me as a social scientist, religion is too broad a word. It's too big a category to pinpoint what exactly it is that's happening to get somebody to live longer, say seven and a half years or, or whatever it is between religious and non-religious people in terms of longevity. It's not a magic, you know, it, it would just be magic to say it's religion or Christianity makes them live longer. That That's not a causal vector magic. What exactly is it? Well, as I talked about in the book, you know, having, you know, we know that having, uh, you know, someone who loves you and, and that you love, having a purpose in life, having a meaningful life, whatever it is, it, it, it can be religion, but it could be any number of other things. You could work for charities and nonprofits. You can, you know, help the poor. You can man the soup kitchen, it, whatever. There's a thousand things you could do to bring meaning and purpose to your life. That's what uh, drives people to live healthier lives, less likely to smoke and drink. And if you're in a marriage, you're less likely to uh, engage in risky sexual behavior. If you uh, have a family that loves you and that you love, you're less likely to engage in unhealthy diets and, and so forth. Okay. So statistically speaking, what we're looking for there is the specific causal vector. Uh, that is, why are you uh, engaging in less risky behavior or engaging in worse diets or, or, or you know, the things that, that cause you to live, you know, shorter lives versus longer lives, okay? So religion may be a factor, but it's too big a word. What exactly about, and which religions 
you know, maybe Mormons are healthier because they don't drink, you know, and, and alcohol does chip away at your longevity and health and so on. So, uh, but there's nothing magical about, about Mormonism that leads people to live longer lives or healthier lives. You know, it's specific things like that, that I want to focus on now. Uh, so, okay. <laughs> uh, you went through some of those, um, issues historically. I want to make this point, uh, let me check on my time here, uh, that, um, you know, we're talking about current um, religiosity or currently current Christians, modern Christians versus historical. Um, and so my argument, the moral arc is that not that Christians today um, are engaging in things like endorsing slavery and torture and, and, and so forth, forth, but that they, they, and along with the rest of us, have all been pulled up uh, the moral arc by these enlightenment values of, of just super simple stuff like all people should be treated equally under the law. No one should be uh, enslaved. No one should be tortured. Uh, all people should have autonomous control over their bodies and so on and so forth. And um, so my argument is that you, know, you can count on religion and Christianity to do the right thing eventually. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, the slavery thing, yes, of course, the, the Quakers were on the cutting edge and, and the William Wilberforce agitating for the abolition of the slave trade. Yes, all true. They were Christians. But who were their primary opponents in, in the abolition of slavery? It was their fellow Christians. Almost all Christians believed that slavery was the way God made the world. It was perfectly acceptable. I have a whole chapter, a section on this in the Moral Arc about, you know, reading from uh, 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 religious doctrines of the time and sermons. You know, most Christians were totally okay with slavery and justified it, not just biblically, but they had their own arguments uh, that derive from biblical passages. And, uh, and so, but eventually now, of course, not, not a Christian on the planet who would say, yeah, I think slavery is okay, right? So, and, uh, and even so, even in, in the 20th century, something, someone like Martin Luther King Jr., hero of my book, um, you know, he was a pretty liberal Christian. He wasn't a literalist. Uh, his idols uh, or his uh, mentors in, in uh, graduate school were uh, liberal theologians. And by liberal, I mean, you know, socially, politically liberal. And, and Gandhi with non-violent uh, uh, agitation for non-violence for change. And, um, and, and then finally, since I just have two minutes, uh, the, a more current example, because we lived through it, is uh, gay rights, same-sex marriage and so forth. You know, it was all the polls showed for the last 25 years, all the way up until 2015, that, um, that the vast majority of Christians were absolutely against uh, same-sex marriage and gay rights along with pretty much everybody. I mean, both Obama and Hillary said they were against same-sex marriage all the way up till 2011 or so when the, the polls shifted the other way. That's what politicians do. But, uh, but Christians resisted it, absolutely. Um, and, uh, and they had their arguments, biblical arguments, and then other arguments that they derive from, you know, it's not natural, and this is not the, the way things uh, that, that God want to have. Leviticus 18.22, thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It's abomination, and so forth. And, uh, and yet today, most Christians, not all, you know, we're not there yet, you know, they're no longer talking about that. They're just saying, yeah, of course, gays should get married, whatever, we believe in marriage. And in another five or 10 years, pretty much every Christian on earth will go, oh, yeah, gay marriage, totally okay with that. <laughs> and uh, and that's how moral progress is made. And it's not driven by Christianity or religion. Religion's behind the wave. Uh, and, uh, you know, and so <clears throat> that then I would credit enlightenment values, secular values, of which, of course, most Christians totally embrace now, today, but not historically. So I'll stop there, and, and then we can move into the next phase. Thank you very much, Dr. Shermer. We will jump into the rebuttals indeed. And so I've got the timer set for you, Mike Jones. Ten minutes, and the floor is all yours. Oh, I think you're on mute still, Mike. You're right. Sorry about that. No I just want to share the slide I have on an intrinsic and extrinsic religiosity again. Uh, can you see that one there? 
Okay. I just want to reiterate uh, what these terms mean. Uh, we're not talking about like extrinsic, like as a society and intrinsic as in personal. These are different types of orientations and individuals. So someone who has extrinsic orientation is an individual, but they're a Christian for cultural reasons. They're a Muslim for cultural reasons. Uh, there is intrinsic religiosity. This person uh, is religious because they want to follow the core tenets of the faith. Uh, so what will scientists will do is they'll give someone a religious orientation scale, like a little questionnaire to find out what they are in the last subtle questions. So if like someone were to ask, they were asked, like, why do you go to church? Someone would say, well, because my family goes to church or it's just the way I grew up. They're going to gravitate more towards the intrinsic uh, category. If someone says, I go there because I want to feel the um, uh, God's purpose in my life or feel the Holy Spirit around me, they're going to gravitate more towards intrinsic. There's another orientation called quest religion. You can think of them as like the people that are saying, I'm spiritual, just not religious. So there's actually three orientations. So I, I'm, I think there's some confusion here. Uh, in, these are not separate types. Like extrinsic is not like for a societal level. These are different types of individuals. And the, the correlations tend to associate with uh, intrinsic religiosity. It shows there's moderate deterrent to crime associated with physical health, desirable uh, variables like mental health, altruism, et cetera, all these types of things. Uh, and so as far as I can find in the research, this tends to be the consensus. For example, the psychiatrist Andrew Sims, the advantageous, the advantageous effects of religious belief and spirituality on mental and physical health is one of the best kept secrets in psychiatry and medicine generally. I, I really would like to see if there's some sort of data that go against this, because as far as I have found, this tends to be the consensus of what we find in the research. Um, he talked about how there's a built-in problem with uh, religion, uh, that you there is this idea of objective morality. I can stop sharing my screen now. Um, so that somehow there is this objective morality and everyone must be submit to it, submit to the one way. Well, that's just not the case when it comes to Christianity. Matthew 15, 14, Jesus says, just let them go. Let them believe what they want. Matthew 10 says, if your town rejects you and they throw you out, dust off your sandals and move on. We don't see this idea of like submission to the one thing. It allows people to make their choices. And if they reject God, let them go, kind of an attitude. So I want to make sure we get that out clearly. Uh, so yeah, I want to reiterate, Schirmer did not say in his book, The Moral Arc, which is a great book. I encourage people to get it and read it. A lot I agreed with in the book, a lot I disagreed with. But he did not say that Christianity causes these bad effects. He did cite the Paul study, and I wanted to address it because it's always thrown in my face when I'm bringing this topic up. So um, he does say that a, a nation will be better off um, if it's more secular. Well, once again, correlation is not causation. We have to look at what the actual data shows. And the article you cited by Ronald Inglehart, who studied and done polls in all these countries with regards to religious individuals, says the correlation seems to be more reversal. Uh, again, the, the meta-analytical data shows that intrinsic religiosity does lead to good social desirable effects, and that would obviously create better people, and as history would show, that it seems to create better societies. But as societies get better and more comfortable, the next couple generations tend to leave religion. That's what we should expect to see. Comfort, why are you going to seek a god to get through hard and difficult times? That tends to be natural tendencies for humans to do. Um, he says Christianity cannot contribute. Cur uh, curtail the social ills. Well, I mean, that's just sort of like saying, well, because doctors can't get rid of heart disease, how do we know doctors are a force for good? Well, they're doing a lot of really good stuff, even though they can't eliminate the problem entirely. Religion does a lot of good in eliminating some of these social undesirable variables, even though it cannot fully cleanse the human spirit or the human soul, however you want to refer to it. Uh, that doesn't really flow from that. Again, if we look at the actual evidence from intrinsic religiosity, there's plenty of reason to think that it leads to good social desirable effects. And this, is done, this has been studied across multiple studies. Uh, I will say, though, as a caveat, a lot of studies have not really studied secular or atheistic individuals extensively. Why? Well, the new atheist, uh, the atheism sort of growing at a rate it is has not really happened in our history up until about now. So we've not had a lot of time to study to see what the effects will be. Let's check back in 100 years on that. So I also want to say I'm not saying that the benefits of intrinsic religiosity come from magic. I'm definitely not saying that. We're talking about this uh, as an entirely scientific question, not as a metaphysical one. Uh, so, of course, and I also will acknowledge, of course, there are multi-factors that go into every individual. This is why these studies are so important, which try their best to factor the, these things out. 
the study on religious priming is a very good one because that's where they directly study. They'll take religious individuals and they'll prime them with religious sayings or sermons and then study their social desirable effects or how they play out in certain games uh, to see if they cheat or whatnot. And those overwhelmingly show that religion tends to make people far more uh, uh, altruistic throughout those uh, types of experiments. Um, so as I was saying, it doesn't come from magic. The, the argument in the studies is that it comes because people have an internal sense of purpose and meaning, feeling of forgiveness, having hope for life after death. That gives people a sense of security and hope and makes them want to do good or be better people. Uh, you can't get that with extrinsic religiosity. That's why we don't see a lot of the social desirable effects with extrinsic religiosity. For example, there was a meta-analysis that came out a couple of years ago on racism and religiosity. Uh, but what they found in the study was the correlations to racism and prejudice aligned with extrinsic religiosity and not with intrinsic religiosity or Christian orthodoxy. It was more aligned with the extrinsic. And they also noted that was declining over the several decades, possibly indicating it was more of a cultural phenomenon. Uh, so moving on, he talks about how historical Christians believed in slavery. Well, again, I would want to argue how that actually flows from the Bible, just because you can find a verse to justify it. That doesn't necessarily mean it flows from it. For example, I could look at atheists of the past. Like, for example, David Hume was a pretty racist person. Okay, I could say the exact same thing Dr. Shermer said, that you will you can count on atheists to do the right things eventually. So, like, I can go to the past and look at all sorts of horrible people that were atheists. I'm not going to bring it about and say, see, atheism clearly causes bad behavior. That would be fallacious in my reasoning. You actually have to show logically how it would flow from that specific uh, belief. Likewise, you need to show how it flows from Christianity. Like, I could find a verse... And I could use it whatever I uh, want to justify whatever I want. But that's not the Bible causing my behavior. That's me having a bad impulse and find, trying to find justification for it. Um, I don't need to share my screen, but I will talk briefly about the Old Testament here. Because I'm sure anyone could go to the Old Testament and bring up verses uh, and say, well, look, see, look at all this bad verse in the Old Testament. But this can easily be addressed from a Christian standpoint in four easy steps. Step one, Matthew 5.20, uh, Matthew 5.20. Um, 17 to 20, Jesus says he came to fulfill the law, and one, and it shall not be uh, it shall not pass away till it is fulfilled. J Step two, John 19, 20 to 30, Jesus bowed his head and said, It is finished to fulfill the scriptures. Step three, Hebrews 8 13 says the law is passing away and is obsolete. Step four, Jesus and Paul said what Christians are now commanded to do is to love one another. John 15, 12, Galatians 5 14. So when people say, Mike, do you follow any of the Ten Commandments? I say no. Because those were fulfilled in Christ, and I don't. There are some commandments that are you know, stated in both covenants, uh, but I don't follow the uh, the commands of an older red and Greek man if I have a newer red and Greek man. Just because some of the same stipulations can be in both, that doesn't mean I have to follow the old red and Greek man. There are some commands that are in the old that are also the new, but we're under the new covenant, so I don't follow any of the Ten Commandments. I follow the royal law of the command of Christ, which is to love one another. So um, not much more to say there. I... I think I've addressed just about everything I wanted to address. Um, well, I do want to read it again that I do and did, did enjoy the moral arc. I encourage people to read it. A lot of good points in there I did agree with. Um, so yeah, I think I'll just yield the rest of my time at that point. Thank you very much, Mike Jones. We will kick it over for a 10 minute rebuttal from Dr. Shermer. Thank you so much. The floor is all yours. Oh, I think you might be on mute. You're muted. You're muted, Dr. Shermer. Yeah, I got inspired by that uh, from you, and then I uh, forgot to turn on like you did. <laughs> okay, uh, I will stop that and reset and try again. Okay, uh, that was very interesting. Um, uh, expanding on the extrinsic, intrinsic, let's think about that for a minute in terms of how we come to any of our beliefs. Of course, most people, uh, the best proxy for what religion they are is what religion they were raised in. Uh, now, of course, there's tons of exceptions, but just as a generalization, that's true. So uh, it's one thing to say, yeah, that's extrinsic, but that's pretty normal. You know, you get it from your culture. I mean, if, if you and I were born a thousand years ago in India, you know, we wouldn't be Christians. Um, and uh, so what you're talking about with e intrinsic, maybe we can explore this a little bit more in our uh, next section. Um, but this idea that these are people that want to be Christians. Well, okay, what about people that want to be Jews? There are, uh, you know, people that convert to Judaism 
because they think, you know, it's a, it's a better system than Christianity or Islam or any of the others. Uh, okay, so it, it would be interesting to talk about studies of those people, you know, how they make this transition from this kind of extrinsic, the way most of us get our beliefs from our surroundings, our family, our peer groups, our mentors, our culture, and the media, and so on, versus I sat down and I went through all the major religions and laid out the facts, and I determined that that's the right one, and therefore I'm going to follow those tenets, or maybe they don't say the right one. Maybe they say, I like the tenets of this particular religion. They gel with the way I think the world should be structured or how we should treat other people, something like that. And since you emphasize that, then the question would be, uh, you know, would you then propose that uh, as a, say, a social scientist experiment that, uh, that people, say, countries or nations in which more people are intrinsically Christian, they're going to see a decline in crime and violence and rape and homicide, suicide, STDs, abortions, and so forth. Well, we can't run that experiment, but um, but the experiments have been run for us. Um, these are called natural experiments, and you can use the comparative method uh, in in uh, statistical analysis of, of comparing nations. So we we know, for example, since the Second World War, religiosity has plummeted in most of the Europe Northern European countries, and yet these are some of the best places on Earth to live. They are amongst the safest, uh, and uh, and they have, you know, extensive, you know, universal health care. They take care of um, of uh, women when they're pregnant. They, you know, they have maternity leave. They have extremely low levels of um, child, uh, you know, uh, infant mortality, and and uh, and on and on and on. These are great places to live. And and contrary to what you hear on Fox News say, you know, these are not socialistic countries. They they are capitalist countries. They have mixed economies, just like we do. They've just adjusted the dials in a way uh, to make them healthier, better, safer, nicer places to live. And they are not religious. Now, again, just to be clear, it, it's not that they became more secular. That was the magic. It's that they did specific things, uh, you know, policy-wise in terms of public health and laws and and uh, you know economic uh, regulations and so on that makes it a better place. And in, in, in a way, it doesn't really matter if the people are religious or not. I would even just take religiosity out of the equation. It doesn't matter. Uh, but as a consequence, um, and so it, it, maybe we can discuss this as well. You know, why have they become so much less religious? And, you know, one argument is that they just don't need it anymore. I mean, religion served a role of taking care of the poor people and, you know, manning the soup kitchens and, you know, and 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 uh, kind of giving a sop to people that were suffering and, and giving them support. But if, you know, all the boats are rising in the rising tide of you know, of these kind of enlightenment values that make for better living, you don't really need religion anymore. And so as a consequence, you know, most of the, you know, the churches are lots of the big churches in Europe are closing. They're just not needed anymore. Um, and so that intrinsic thing about, you know, li living a healthier, better life or whatever is kind of irrelevant um, in, in, in the larger scale that we, we want to talk about, about in terms of, you know, how healthy society should be. And so, you know, there I, I would ask you to then explain how to explain these Northern European countries that are so successful, living such healthy, you know, having health people that are, you know, having such healthy, long, uh, you know, fulfilling, deeply meaningful lives without religion. You know, now the, your, your proposed experiment, I think we can run this sooner than a century from now. That is the rise of the nuns, the people that tick the box for no religious affiliation. On surveys, as you know, that's about 25% of all Americans now and about 33% of millennials, people born after 1981. Now, they're not atheists, right? I, I, I'm quick to point this out to my fellow atheist friends. You know, they're not, they're not reading Richard Dawkins and, 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 uh, and Christopher Hitchens, right? Maybe they're becoming devotees of uh, Deepak Chopra you know, in that kind of Western Buddhism or their followers of Tony Robbins, uh, you know, in, in, in other words, they're finding other places to get 
meaning and purpose and drive and all the things you talked about are absolutely important. You got to have a reason to get up in the morning and get around, have goals and that, that are beyond you, just you. So there again, no magic as you, as you acknowledge, it's that well, what specifically is it that some religions are doing that are so inspiring to people? And, and really this is pretty much how the self-help movement has evolved in America over the last half century. They started off kind of following the, you know, the kind of positive thinking principles of the prosperity gospel preachers, and then, you know, just took the God part out of it and, and just and, and took the basic, the principles, the rules uh, of what to do uh, to uh, live a meaningful, purposeful life, you know, get up in the morning and start off by making your bed, you know, and say something nice to your spouse and, and get a good workout in and have a meaningful job and career and, and develop some friends and talk to your neighbors and, and, and make donations to the local charities and, you know, and, and on and on, there's like 20 things you could do. And, uh, you know, whether or not religion gets the credit for some of that, you know, Norman Vincent Peale and the early self-help, um, gurus, they, you know, they started off, they were kind of religious, but, you know, the religion's kind of been taken out of that. Because again, it's too broad a word. Uh, You know, we want to drill down and find exactly what I can do tomorrow to live a better life. And you will say, well, you should become a Christian. Okay, maybe that's one way. Uh, But maybe there's other ways. And so in other words, it's not Christianity, that's the causal vector. It's something underlying Christianity and the other systems that work quite well in these, say, non-religious European countries. Apparently, people can do everything you've described without Christianity, without religion at all. Anyway, so I'll I'll uh, yield there, and we can move on to the next section. Thank you very much, Dr. Shermer. So we will jump into the next section, indeed, and that is 10-minute cross-examination. So we'll start with Mike asking, or I should say Mike Jones, asking question toward Dr. Shermer, and then switch it for another 10 minutes in the opposite direction. So with that, the floor is all yours, Mike Jones, to ask questions. Sure. So I want to just get some clarification on some of the things I just heard. Uh, So do you think, like, the religiosity level would be, like, the only variable? I mean... It, I kind of, I was kind of getting some mixed feelings. So, I mean, you, you're acknowledging like religiosity variable, uh, li- religiosity level is not the only variable that contribute contributes to Europe's, you know, growth and uh, explosion of uh, social desirable effects. Correct. Yeah. Well, okay. So we, what we're seeing is that, you know, again, just religiosity has plummeted in the last 50 years in many of these Northern European countries. Uh, and they have, um, you know, become healthier, wealthier, better places to live. You know, the average per capita GDP is very high in these countries, so pretty close to what it is in the United States, and, and on and on. Now, it's not, I'm not claiming they gave up religion, and that's how they became better societies. I'm saying religion's just irrelevant. Right. So then, I mean, why, why would we even bring that up if we're acknowledging this is merely a correlation and there's no actual causal factors there? Well, because we're well, we're debating whether Christianity is dangerous, and, and as I said at the start, it depends. <laughs> it's good when it does good. It's evil when it does evil, or whatever. Here, I think we're we're getting to the point in the history of civilization where it's just not needed anymore. We're, we're figuring out what we need to do to make the world a better place and for people to have more meaningful lives. And again, you if you personally, Christianity does it for you, okay, good. Uh, but it isn't a factor that we, we you could generalize and say, you know, it'd be better if, you know, more countries were Christian. In the same way, I, in, in the way I would argue, uh, democracy is a better uh, uh, form of governance than autocracies and theocracies and, and authoritarian governments and dictatorships and so on. Uh, and that has been proven out pretty, pretty strongly. And, uh, and, and same thing with uh, free markets, you know, at least mixed economies with a strong free market capitalistic ethic and system built in place is better. It's better for the citizens. It's better for the country. It's better for everybody. You know, so that's why a lot of politicians and economists think we should spread democracy and free market economics. But I would not then say and Christianity. Right. But that wouldn't show Christianity is dangerous. For example, we could live without broccoli and we could have all the great health benefits without ever eating broccoli. That wouldn't mean broccoli was dangerous. 
That's right. Of course, you can eat broccoli, and you can eat and you can eat Christianity too. That that's right. Yes, that's right. Yeah, sure. Again, so I'm just trying. Uh, I'm just trying to see how the correlations yeah. in Europe would actually lead to the conclusion Christianity is dangerous. I mean, sure, it is entirely. I would not possible. say that. Yeah, the, the, yeah. I, I am conceding the point that it, okay. it may not be dangerous when it's replaced by something else. Historically, it has been. Uh, again, you know, I, you know, this same-sex marriage example or slavery or, or or whatever. Most of those, almost all those. Rights revolutions were generated not through uh, Christian agitation for change, although some of the people that did it were Christian, but it was something else underneath that. Uh, and again, most of the people resisting those th- those revolutions were Christians. Well, I mean, I could say the same thing about atheists of the past. They were very racist. They promoted eugenics. I mean, that wouldn't mean that those ideologies like humanism. Not atheists. Everybody. Almost Everybody. Right. So uh, well, if, if it was say, everybody, how can you claim it was just coming from Christianity? It seems like it was more of a cultural effect than anything else. Oh, it's not. It, it's not. It, it's not. Uh, but Christians had no problem justifying those beliefs that almost everybody held through religion. So, again, it's not that it's not that Christianity or the Bible directly made them racist. You know, the racism was rampant everywhere. Uh, and, and, but but again, if it's such a great force for good in the world, then you know why were they so behind the eight ball on this? Why did it take so long for Christians to come around and go? You know what? I think it's all right if you know gays get the same treatment under the Constitution as everybody else in the country. That you know that took a long time to to to, to get well to get not not just Christians but everybody. But Christians are supposed to be the you know the, the you know the party of the book, right? That you know we're we're, we're the moral party. You know we're on the cutting edge here. No, I, I would think say so. that that's the exact opposite. I would say the Bible's pretty clear. <laughs> Christians are depraved. They're still sinners. They're not going to be perfect. But let me ask you this. I mean, like we've had doctors for centuries, and doctors are still fighting disease. I mean, if it's such a force for good, haven't they gotten rid of disease then? <laughs> okay, that's a good analogy. Well, all right. So again, I guess I would answer that by saying, um, the, if you can, if we can extrapolate the good parts from Christianity and spread those principles around, then okay, I'm all right with that. Like for example, um, you know, there's kind of a, a distinction in in the last couple of decades in Christianity between the sort of what, what prosperity gospel Christians versus the kind of social justice Christians. Uh, you know, you get the Joel Olsteins and, and, and the Reverend Ikes, you know, God wants you to be rich and, and you know, and so forth. And then you got the kind of social justice, you know, well, you know, Jesus told us we're supposed to take care of the poor and help the needy. And, you know, and so there's this kind of division in Christianity. Well, I would say, you know, the pr- prosperity gospel guys, you know, this is probably not that good for morals and so on. And it's a little greedy and selfish and the uh, you know, the sense of social justice. I don't like that word because it's affiliated so much with the far left, but <laughs> understand. Uh, but 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 Christians who think, well, we it is our job to take care of the poor. We have a moral obligation to help people who can't help themselves. To which I say, Amen, brother. I have a, I want to move on to um talking about intrinsic and extrinsic. You talked a little bit about in your rebuttal about how like you could replicate this idea about having a purpose. Um, having meaning in your life through uh, secular means, but it really sounds like you're just trying to substitute intrinsic uh, motivators with extrinsic motivators, like having meaning, finding meaning and purpose in your culture and your community. Mm-hmm. That just moves it right mm-hmm. to extrinsic religiosity. In that mm-hmm. sense. Yeah, that's a good point. It, it's an interesting the intrinsic point. Yeah. orientation yeah. is very much like yeah. I get meaning because I love God. I want to follow God. I want to follow. I want to feel the Holy Spirit kind of thing. I don't see how you could replicate that from a secular perspective in these studies. Yeah, you got to – no, I but, no, I think you can't, but I, I, I take your point. People are going to be more motivated to take action if they really believe uh, it, the principles of the group, whatever it is, um, versus – you know, your idea of extrinsic, they're just kind of going along with it, you know, whether they really believe it or not, you know, maybe, maybe not, uh, you know, you're far less likely to act on that. Uh, so to use some current examples, like, you know, this, so I think about this distinction of different kinds of belief. So, you know, this idea that this pizza, you know, that, that this, the Democrats are running this ring, this crazy conspiracy theory, um, you know, and how many people really believe that? Well, you know, the surveys showed, you know, Republicans, conservatives, a lot of them seem to believe it. I don't think they really believe that, except the one guy that went to the uh, Comet Ping Pong Pizzeria with a gun. He believed it because that's what you would do if there was a pedophile ring next door. You'd go and do something about it. Right. <laughs> so I, I don't think people really believe that. 
uh, and uh, it, you know, even the the this week, last week of the uh, you know hacking and all that stuff. I don't think most of these Republicans that said they were on board with Trump, I don't think they really believed it. I mean, their own Justice Department, their own AG said no, no, no fraud. Uh, fair election. And uh, so the, the ones that were hanging on like Cruz and so on, I think there's there, it, that's a kind of a mythic belief or a metaphorical belief. Like I'm a, I'm a Republican. I'm, I'm supporting, I support the team. I'm going to just say, I think it was rigged because my boss says it is. I don't think they really believed it. I think on Wednesday we saw the people who did believe it. They really, you know, they marched to the Capitol and they stormed into the, broke the windows and went in, into the, into the, the dome. They believed it. That, that that's what true belief engenders. So here it matters whether it's true or not, right? Because that's not true. So they shouldn't be storming the, and you don't have to go to the Comet Ping Pong with a gun because there's no basement and there's no pedophile ring there, right? So it really comes down, Michael, I think to, to the, to what extent you can show that your doctrines are right and true in, in the empirical sense, which I, I know you've done debates with, um, uh, uh, with other uh, atheists um, like Dillahunty, Matt Dillahunty is very good on this uh, about those particular things. That's not what we're supposed to be debating, but it, I think you've just identified the the idea that to go from extrinsic to intrinsic, you have to convince people those doctrines that we believe that you should believe are you should believe them because they're true. And here, I think you have the problem of of making the transition from saying someone like Jesus really existed and he was really crucified. I think there's enough evidence even by secular the, um, Bible historians and so on. Minute left. Uh, like Bart Ehrman, that a man named Jesus really existed. And, you know, the Romans, they crucified everybody for anything. So yeah, he was probably crucified, but to, that you can put on an empirical truth basis, basis, but to make the next step, he was resurrected you know, that's, that, you know, that's a hundred billion to one odds, you know, hundred billion people left. have lived and died and none of them have come back from the well, dead. Let me except ask you for this really quick one. since we're about to wrap up. How would you up? do that? Yeah, um, sorry. I'm, I'm so rambling. Just, sorry. <laughs> I'll give you some I mean, time. You to, could understand my, this. I mean, even if, if Christianity is false, it could still have pragmatic benefits. There's a difference between pragmatic and true. For example, Ptolemaic astronomy is pragmatic, even though it's not true. It's useful for ancient navigators. So we can understand it's still pragmatic, even if it wasn't necessarily true. Yeah. Uh, right. Yes, I agree uh, on certain issues, but it seems to me you're arguing, and maybe we can transition to now. I'm yeah. talking to you in my ten minutes uh, that to make the transition from being an extrinsic Christian, where you're going along with it because you know your parents were Christian and your friends are Christian and your spouse is Christian and on it, and you kind of yeah yeah I guess I believe it, but you don't you know you haven't really thought deeply about it. You know I would put it in that kind of mythic truth category. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's my team. Yeah, yeah, I think it's probably Jesus was resurrected. He died for my sins. Yeah, yeah okay. But you want to say no, no. It, 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 the intrinsic, it's the intrinsic part where you know somebody really studies it and thinks about it and thinks, yes, yes, I actually think that's true. I've gone through the arguments. I read these books, and that's the one. Um, you know, so there. Then now, now this whole debate kind of turns on. Yeah, but is it really true? <laughs> is that is it is it have you really made the transition from mythically true to empirically true like we, we can definitely get consensus that jesus not just died but came back from the dead you know that that, that would be an extraordinary claim do you have extraordinary evidence and then now you're down the rabbit hole of that debate which is a whole other debate you know did the resurrection happen just and so we're uh, on the same page we got, you know, we're to me my one yeah. minute into the cross yeah go ahead michael yeah, go, yeah, go, yeah go I would just yeah. let's let's compare it with Judaism because I, I don't believe um, you know modern Talmudic Judaism is true, but nonetheless, a lot of these studies on intrinsic religiosity look at most. I mean, they're mostly studying in the Judeo-Christian West, so they do include a pretty fair sample of uh, Jewish subjects, even though the from what I've seen, the majority seem to be the various Christian denominations. So I, I could look at someone and say, like, yeah, they are intrinsically religious in their sense of Judaism. They really think it's true, and from those benefits flow, you know. From that benefits can yeah, flow. Yeah. So okay. I don't even have to right. agree with them that, it, that their Talmudic Judaism is true. I just say, but still, there's going to be a lot of benefits from that in, intrinsic orientation they have there. W would you say that too with uh, Muslims? Sure. Yeah. There's actually um, a fair amount of studies that have looked at uh, Muslims, especially in the Judeo-Christian West, and if they're intrinsically oriented, 
some of the studies I said at the end on um, violence uh, did look at um, uh, center in some Islamic countries, and they found that uh, they're, if they're more intrinsically oriented, they, they actually decreases aggression and violence. Well, that, that may be, but uh, their treat, uh, it, it, the portions of the uh, Muslim world that embraces Sharia law, uh, their treatment of women and gays is pretty abysmal. It is, and, yeah. and and the more they really believe it, the worse it is for women and gays. I mean, they're throwing right. gays off the top of buildings now in 2020. Right, and I would I would try to argue. Now, I'm not an expert on Islam. I want to clarify that, but I would probably try to argue that you could make a pretty good case that could flow from Islamic doctrine. Uh, that's why I don't. When I do these yeah. things, I don't say yeah. is, you know I'm not going to yeah. defend other religions. I'm just going to try to focus on Christianity, namely all of Christianity, Catholicism, to Orthodoxy. To, evangelicalism etc yeah but see here here you're making a move from uh saying that uh you know intrinsic ex, extrinsic intrinsic and you can't comment on the intrinsic value or or uh, i should say validity of islamic doctrines um but but you can on on christian doctrines well there it does matter which is the right one right which is the right holy book and, you know, and you believe that, the, the, I don't know what you believe about the Quran, but obviously you think the Bible is probably more insp- divinely inspired or more correct or I don't know what. More reliable is what the term I use. More, more reliable, yeah. Well, as, as you know, m- most Muslims would disagree with you. So how could I, an anthropologist from Mars, coming down and go, whoa, okay, I got you and then I got this other guy over here and who, who's the right one? And you make your arguments, he makes his arguments. I can't see how we could determine which is the right one. Uh, right, that would be a, a separate debate. But I think the uh, anthropologist from Mars could determine which was actually far more beneficial just by studying, doing the types of studies that I went over in these various cultures. Again, most of the studies I said, I mean, most of the meta-analyses, for example, are centered in Judeo-Christian West. or in America, Western Europe. Very few are going to be done or conducted outside of those areas because of you know, it's very easy for a social scientist living in New York to do a study there versus flying to like Kenya, setting up, finding subjects there. It's much harder. So they're going to be more centered in, in the yeah. West. Yeah. But then what would you say about, say, South American countries that are heavily Catholic? They're Christians. They believe Jesus died for their sins and the whole thing. And let's just give them the benefit of the doubt that they really believe it. They're not just going along with it. Uh, and yet, you know, they're the you know, the. the the, the quality of their lives are considerably lower, say, than the United States or in these Northern European countries. Rates of violence and and uh, and homicides are pretty high in a lot of these Christian countries, and standard of living pretty poor in a lot of them. You know, so there's lots of these kind of both historical and current examples of Christian nations that don't kind of have the benefits that you're talking about. So yeah, let me address that. Uh, so for example, for one, we need to focus on the fact that these are multi-factors coming to these countries. I'm sure a lot of the problems in Venezuela right now are more political than religious. We also have to recognize within uh, Catholicism uh, on a global sense, there's a lot of intrinsic religiosity in that sense. People are religious just because uh, that was their culture. And that is something I discourage because in the studies, I find uh, I would see things like racism, prejudice, um, uh, cheating on your spouse tend to correlate with ex- extrinsic religiosity. I would want to see ex- extrinsic religiosity either decrease because it always seems to correlate with social undesirable effects. So if we're going to go into like Argentina or Bolivia, we would have to check and see. We have to find subjects in the country, find the intrinsic and the extrinsic and, ki- and compare uh, the social desirable effects in that same sense. We just can't look at a religious country and go religious problems. Well, what type of religiosity is really dominating that country? Yeah. So if you went to a thought experiment, you went to one of these countries and the studies show that they're mostly extrinsic Christians, uh, what would you do to shift them into intrinsic Christianity? Well, I would tell them to watch my videos. You know. <laughs> Buy your books. <laughs> yeah. That's I mean, funny. that's what I want to encourage. I like that. I mean, I would, yes, the, the way yes. you do it is the, the way that, you know, the, the pastors like Tim Keller uh, or C.S. Lewis, that you teach them the, the truth of Christ, you get them excited about Christ. So the same way a Muslim apologist would do, you get them excited about, uh, you get them excited about Allah. Well, I mean, you and I may not agree about that, but I mean, like the Christian would say, you got to get them excited about Jesus. You got to get them to actually love Jesus and want to do good things because they love Jesus. How do you, how do you explain that Jews do not accept Jesus as the savior 
uh, in as much as they know all the arguments, you know, you know, you could just take these rabbis that are spent their whole lives reading nothing but all of this material. They know all the arguments and they're not convinced. Right. I would refer people to a great debate uh, that Michael, Dr. Michael Brown, who is Jewish, had on uh, the Sid Roth show uh, with a Jewish apologist several years ago. And I think that was a pretty good debate. A lot of it, I would say, I would defer to Dr. Brown. He's more of the expert on that. But a lot of it is very dominated by Talmudic thought. Uh, there's an idea with pervasive in Judaism, the Talmud uh, was sort of like the oral that's supposed to go along. And that's how you interpret the Old Testament in that sort of sense. So I would probably use, would, would that, think that would as a that possibility. Then be, would that then be extrinsic Judaism versus intrinsic? Not necessarily, because they, they truly, when we're talking about extrinsic and intrinsic, we're talking about if a person truly believes that religion is true or if they're just there for yeah. the cultural reasons. I'm sure there are plenty yeah plenty of Talmudic Jews that truly believe Judaism is true and they truly believe that God wants to give them purpose and meaning and they want to please they want to please Yahweh I, I don't doubt that at all so no I would say they can be intrinsic and fully believe the Talmud the Old Testament yeah. all that stuff yeah and here I would you know point out that in, in the Jewish culture uh, I mean most Jews today are pretty secular um, you know they're sort of yeah, cultural Jews and they get the they get the benefits though. I mean, they you know they encourage a highly uh, educated uh, uh, you know uh, upbringing of their kids, and they teach them morals and values, and they have customs, and you know the they they follow the holidays and so on. Even though they're not most of the ones, at least that I know, they're, they they don't even believe in God. You know, there's kind of a cultural Judaism that I think has the benefits of your intrinsic Christianity because it's those components that they're teaching, they're, they're spreading by cultural diffusion, say, in, in the Jewish community, that's giving them the benefits that well, you're talking about without any of the, one of the, any of the beliefs. One minute let me left. clarify, because some studies do find positive associations with both forms of religiosity, and some find a positive associations with quest orientation as well. Uh, the most benefits, though, tend to come with intrinsic, and there are some negative variables that are associated with extrinsic, like prejudice, racism, uh, uh, adultery, these types of things. And just because there is cultural Judaism, that doesn't necessarily mean they're going to have all the benefits of the intrinsic orientation. Uh, it would depend on if we look at each individual subject. This is why I focus more on the studies and not necessarily these hypothetical type of scenarios. Yeah. Well, this is why I want to push that point about making that shift from extrinsic to intrinsic. For you, you know, it's highly focused on um, Jesus as the uh, Savior and accepting him as your Savior because he uh, died for our sins and was resurrected and so on. And Jews just go, I know all the arguments. I read all the books. I saw your videos and so on. I don't believe it. Uh, I just don't. And yet I'm, you know, I read the old, uh, he's, they're, they're people of the book. It's just the Old Testament book. It's not the New Testament. Okay. So, um, and, and now we're back to empirical truths. How, how could we decide? I mean, maybe they watched the video you just suggested and go, nah, you know, I'm just, the, the problem here in step three, he made this move and I'm just not following it. I don't accept that Jesus is the savior and the story. I'm still a Jew and boom. So it does come down to what's really true, and if we can't determine what's really true, then how could you really be an in intrinsic anything? We're at time. So... Other than it's really just kind of metaphorical mm -hmm. truth or something. Sorry, go ahead. Mike, if you, uh, Mike Jones, if you have a really quick, pithy response since the question was posed to you, we can give you a short response, and otherwise we got to go into closing statements. I'll just go, I'll just flow into my closing from there. We'll jump um, in. Let me reset this. Yeah, it sounds good. Yeah. Yeah, so I would simply point out that, again, when we're looking at intrinsic, it's not whether it is true. It is that the person believes it is true regardless. Time set for five minutes. So, all right, good. So it's about it's about that. They, they true these, these Talmudic Jews really do believe that um, – they really do believe uh, that, that that religion is true. And then from that belief that it is true, they flow. It doesn't necessarily have to be true. It's still pragmatic and useful. So I want to uh, reiterate – that basic idea the most benefits are coming from intrinsic religiosity and from that it would simply flow scientifically there's no evidence christianity is dangerous it leads to harmful consequences in society uh, and i would invite people to give me actual evidence that it does and i have been studying this topic for probably uh, over a, over a decade now at this point 
uh, first on my own and then eventually on, on my channel in various aspects. And there's just no evidence that Christianity leads to these dangerous consequences that so many skeptics imply they do. Now, Dr. Shermer, um, I was actually surprised you even agreed to the debate topic tonight because I never really thought you were the one who would say those types of things. I've seen, I've, I have a lot of respect for your work and I know you don't think Christianity is necessarily dangerous. So I just want to make sure I put that out there so people are aware. But I mean, I do see a lot of other skeptics do argue uh, from your work or from the work of like Gregory Paul that Christianity does lead to dangerous consequences. For example, you put out that tweet uh, last year, which you know really got my attention and wanted me to start this debate, where you said like studies show that secular people are more on average less racist, less ethnocentric, less homophobic, less likely to hit their children. I mean, I was a little that's when I was like, all right, let's have a debate because the study that cited on hitting your children is actually a very tiny study of just 3,000 religious parents in the LA area. And it differentiates between corporal punishment and actual physical abuse. It just says that you know, people that attend religious services are more likely to invoke corporal punishment, but there doesn't correlate to actual physical abuse. So we need to be very careful about the types of things we say. I could go through every one of those uh, different aspects and go into the actual data to show it, including the homophobic one. Uh, there was a study done a couple of years ago on homo negativity in 79 different countries and found that it's a mixed. In a lot of like post-communist countries, more religiosity, specifically intrinsic religiosity, correlates with lower homo negativity. Uh, so the idea that it somehow causes the Christianity uh, through intrinsic religiosity is causing these types of bad behaviors. It's just unwarranted. And again, I want to reiterate one of your biggest arguments, which is historically Christians have been bad in the past, and they'll get better as time goes on. They're being sort of dragged into the future. But I would say all humans are being dragged into the future by people that are trying to do the right thing. There have been Christians that have been trying to do the right thing. There have been Christians who have done the wrong thing. There have been atheists who are doing the right thing, and there are atheists who have done the wrong thing. We can look at atheists that promoted eugenics in the past. We can look at Christians that promoted eugenics in the past. We would not say that either of those ideologies caused eugenics. It just was bad people doing bad things. And we cannot argue that necessarily either your worldview or my worldview is causing all those bad behaviors. We need to look at the actual science. The meta-analysis are going to be our best game in town to study the effects of religiosity, specifically intrinsic religiosity. And we cannot make correlation causation fallacies. We need to look at the data as best we can. Uh, with that, I don't have much more to go over. I really did enjoy this conversation. Uh, this has been a dream of mine to debate Dr. Shermer ever since I first saw him on the stage. So I am quite honored. Um, and again, I, I do enjoy reading your material. I need to get that issue that issue you're coming out on because that looks interesting. Uh, so thanks for I'll this. I'll send you one. <laughs> it's perfect. Great. I will make you an honorary member of the Skeptic Society and Skeptic Magazine, Michael. <laughs> perfect. That would be, uh, that'd be quite uh, an honor. Because you're obviously uh, into science, and I love that. So, yeah, again, on the um, uh, on the studies, you know, I think it's it's debatable. I mean, I have piles of studies that show, you know, the opposite of what you're saying. I think the meta-analysis is probably the way to go. Let's say it's true. Again, I, 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 to me, religion is too big a word as a category of, like, what's the causal vector at work? It, it matters to drill down and figure out exactly what is this Christian doing tomorrow that makes them live a longer, healthier, happier, more meaningful life. And how much of it is intrinsic. That is, you got to believe the, you know, the, the doctrines of that particular religion and not the other religions. And there, that always worries me because that sets up a kind of them and us tribalism that taps into that deep um, part of our nature, one of the inner demons, I would call it of uh, a xenophobia and tri tribalism of people that are different from us. And r religion has a, a pretty, uh, you know, strong track record of, of being divisive historically. <clears throat> and the fact that most Christians today are not like that, you know, is a testament, I think, to the other factors that went into the uh, moral progress, things like democracy and rule of law and property rights and, uh, you know, and the, and the ideas behind, um, you know, this, we're, we're all, uh, you know, born equal under the law. That That is, wh whether it's the creator or nature or whatever, wherever, you know, natural law, wherever we get these rights, um, you all get them. We all get them just by dint of being human and 
and we're born and you happen to live in a country that honors that and we're going to defend that and on and on the fact that jefferson and and company had slaves or they you know they they, they refused to write into the constitution uh that you know we, we won't allow slavery even if some of them wanted to do that you know and, and on and on that that was part of their cultures the fact that this moral progress has happened where pretty much nobody thinks like that anymore and everybody pretty much accepts that all people should be treated equally under the law, I think can't be attributed to Christianity or any one particular religion, even though some of them were religious people or Christians who agitated for those moral causes. And to you know put a fine point on it, again, it was mostly their fellow Christians that were against it. But my larger point is that um, you know, we should all work together toward these values that we seem to pretty much agree are the ones that we should be working toward. That is, in the West, most people agree that these are values that we should hold sacred. And, uh, and, and, and so kind of culturally, societally, progress-wise, morally, that's the way to go. Personally, again, um, you know, whatever you do or th this person or that person does to, you know, leave it, lead a better life, uh, okay, good. Uh, and But if you want to spread that, you want to say, okay, we want to publish a study and, and show these are the 12 things you should do to lead a longer, healthier, happier, higher quality, more meaningful, um, happy, you know, more, more purposeful life. Here they are. Well, there are studies like that. <laughs> and, you know, one of them is having, you know, kind of a sacred uh, purpose in life, something that's beyond you. And uh, so, OK, the kind of Christianity you're describing, you know, sounds like it could fulfill that, even though I don't think a lot of Christians <laughs> uh, do that. But in any case, if that's the case, fine. But there's a lot of other ways to get there. And so I, I would also be in favor of any other way you can get there. Uh, you know, without joining some crazy cult or something, but, you know, other religions or just other movements, anything that, you know, gives you that kind of sacred value in your life, a reason to get up in the morning and get out and have, you know, a purposeful um, existence. And um, I was just doing a podcast about Ayn Rand the other day with somebody and, uh, you know, objectivism in Rand's philosophy kind of became that, you know, for objectivists. Now it, it had a lot of flaws, but my point is that, it gives one of the reasons Atlas Shrugged is such a popular novel amongst 15 to 30 year olds is it, it, it gives this kind of sacred value purpose. This is it go. And it's very inspiring to a lot of younger people. So I think we need that. We need that in, in our lives and you know, the kind of Christianity you describe, okay, that may be one way, but uh, I don't want to go so far as to say it's the only way. In fact, I would say the opposite of that. So to that extent, then, I bid you good night. <laughs> or you. no, we have Q and A. That's right. Thank you very yeah. much, and thanks for the debate. No, that was good, and, and thank thanks for again, Michael, for the thoughtful uh, commentary and, uh, and and for sticking to science. That's good, and for reading my book, I appreciate that. Thank you very much, gentlemen, well, and thanks everybody for your questions. We'll jump into that Q and A right now. I want to remind you, our guests are linked in the description so that you can hear plenty more or read plenty more where that came from. As we really do appreciate our guests. And we'll jump into that Q&A. The first question coming from Dr. Cy Gartz said, for Dr. Shermer, it appears that you are saying that Christianity is no longer necessary or useful, but not necessarily dangerous. Is that correct? Uh, again, it depends on wh what we're talking about exactly. <laughs> you know, had you asked me, I don't know, 50 years ago about women's rights, I would say, you know, Christianity was dangerous for women, women's rights, that is. Uh, to you know, re more recently, you know, Christianity was not good for gay rights, same-sex marriage rights, and so forth. Um, you know, but that again, they've changed on that, thankfully. But for other forces outside of Christianity, gotcha. And thanks, Vin, for your question. Said, what do you feel are the best ways? I think this is for Dr. Shermer. They said, what do you feel are the best ways for those leaving the faith to replace the valuable elements found in the church, such as a focus on community, reflection, music? temperance and social support right uh well there's books about this and uh uh you know and it's not so much replacing like okay i need you to, to get rid of this and, and do that um it's whatever it takes to get that you know so again having a reason to get up in the morning having a job having a, a relationship marriage is good 
having kids is good. Building a family, having friends, having extended family and friends and community, being actively involved in politics, your local politics or the society, the community, joining and working for nonprofits. And that could be a church. It could be anything. Um, but, the, you know, the point is, uh, is, is having a goal or purpose that's not, not just you. Of course, you have to take care of you and yourself, right? You got to have a job. You got to make money. You got to pay your bills. got to be responsible. You got to work out. You got to ha- have a decent diet and so on. That's about you. But, but, but beyond that, you know, your, your spouse, your family, your friends, your community also matter just as much. And so you got to work toward those. And um, uh, I was trying to think of the name of this book of this uh, guest I had on my podcast, uh, it, basically how to live to be a hundred. Well, <laughs> you know, it turns out exercise and diet is, you know, not the, not the primary way to get there. It's having family and friends and caring about other people and having a sacred purpose in your life. This appears to have salubrious effects for health, longevity, happiness, and so on. And, uh, you know, meeting and greeting your neighbors every day and being friendly and having uh, meaningful relationships, being in love, you know, these kinds of things, again, Christianity doesn't have a monopoly on that, uh, you know, seem to work for everybody. And there's, you know, lots and lots of studies. We, we didn't get into that uh, about that show that. Just on a side note, real quick, the first guy that asked the question, that's Dr. Seigard. Great guest for your podcast, biochemist. He's a theistic evolutionist okay. like me. Um, right. He wrote a book uh, on how he was a scientist, went from atheist to Christian. You were the opposite. You were a Christian scientist, Christian, and you became a scientist, became an atheist. You might have a good conversation, like a you know reverse. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, yeah. By the way, on that, that, that on the can science, Christians be scientists? Of course they can, and they are, and. Uh, and the 65 percent, uh, okay, the, you know, the distinction is between, you know, rank and file scientists, studies done like, say, m- members of the AAAS or whatever, which is a huge body that, that you know, is more representative of the general population. And there, yeah, I, uh, I think the 65 percent was right. The, 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 the other study you, you referred to was, you know, of members of the National Academy of Science. So these are like the most elite scientists. And there the, the numbers plunged to like 7 percent were or Christian or religious or something right. like that. That's true. You know, but of course, as you know, Francis Collins is the head of the NIH. He's one of the greatest scientists of, of our time. And, you know, the Human Genome Project and so on. I, I know him. He's a great guy, super smart guy. Uh, very, he's an evangelical Christian. I encourage people to read his book on evolution. You know, he, he accepts all the tenets of evolution, all, all of it. And, and he makes one of the most passionate defenses of evolutionary theory I've ever read. It's good as anything Dawkins has written. And in fact, I encourage religious people to read his book, Francis Collins, because he's on their team. So I know they'll be more receptive to what he has to say, because that's how it works. Um, and, and so I, I'm glad to hear you're a theistic evolutionist. If you mean it, by the way, the same way Francis Collins means it. I, I do. I, I would uh, probably be more closer to Stephen Jay Gould uh, in oh, how okay. evolution happened. But yeah. Thank you okay. very much, gentlemen. And we'll jump into the next question. This one coming in from Jack. Thank you. Says, do you think secularism, atheism, or agnosticism create the same kinds of zealots or radicals that religion sometimes does? I'm not sure who this question is for. I think it would for sure be for Dr. Shermer, but I'm, uh, I suppose it could be they didn't specify. So we'll, we'll start with it Dr. Shermer. It certainly can be. Uh, after, um, yeah, there was a kind of a big, big split in the atheist movement. Initially, after Dawkins' book uh, in 2006, The God Delusion, and uh, I noticed that I was getting hammered a lot for not being more militant in my atheism. And it's like, what are you talking about? I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm publicly known as an atheist. And no, no, that's not enough. You got to get out there and evangelize for atheism. It's like, what's there to evangelize for? It's, it, atheism isn't even a thing. It's not a worldview. I just don't believe in God, full stop. You know, I mean, if you want to talk about humanism or secular humanism or, or you know, democracy or civil rights, you know, I'll talk about all that. And promote those things, but you know, atheism isn't anything to, to, to anyway. So there was kind of a split in that in the movement there, and then I don't know around 2010, 2011 or so, there was another split uh, over what was called atheist plus. The plus is social justice, you know, which sounds like a good word, but you know, we know what that means now. It's kind of far left progressive politics. Well, I I'm not that, you know, I'm very critical of a lot of that. So then I got hammered for that. It's like. Oh my gosh, this is, you know, this is like what the Ayn Rand objectivists went through and what the feminists went through and the Marxists went through. It's like this is something social movements do. They splinter and fall apart because people get too fanatical. 
and then they purge their own kind, right? Instead of going after the other group that we don't like, you know, those Democrats or whatever, you know, they end up destroying themselves from within. And uh, that's not that's not healthy for anybody, I think. So, yeah, that does happen. But that happens to all social movements. Thank you very much. And Chris Gammon, appreciate your question, said, wouldn't any belief that is wrong be dangerous on some level? Does that just make the question, quote, is Christianity true? I, so uh, the question seems to be, um, if it's untrue, does it not make it dangerous in some way? I mean, it depends. I mean, we really have to be careful here because what are we talking about? Are we talking about dangerous for society? for how societies function, for how individuals function, not necessarily. For the quest for truth, well, then, yeah, it would be dangerous for the quest of truth if a belief is actually untrue. Uh, But, I mean, we have to acknowledge there are numerous beliefs that you don't have, that I don't have, that people in various parts of the world have that are are perfectly fine and work with pragmatic societies. Uh, I would like to say that, no, 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 oh, oh, the best benefits come from Christianity. Um, I don't know if I can say that from the studies alone. I'm trying my best to just stick to what the science says. Uh, and there is plenty of evidence, like if you're intrinsically religious and Talmudic, uh, Jew, uh, Talmudic Jew, or if you're a Mormon, um, if you're if a Muslim in many of these Western countries where the studies are performed, uh, there is a lot of benefits from uh, these religions just for a societal uh, a stance, just for understanding how societies function or for the overall general well-being of an individual. Now, with regards to the overall quest for truth, well, sure, if a belief is untrue, it's going to be dangerous for the quest for truth. But that's a debate for another time. Gotcha. And thank you very much for your question. This one comes in from Brian Stevens said, to both when it comes to science, have you noticed a link between religion and denying science such as climate change? Oh, well, there, no, um, it, it, it's not religion in that example. It's politics. They're the, the best predictor for who's skeptical of climate change is, is, is your political position, and we all know what that is. So conservatives slash Republicans are far more skeptical of climate change than liberals, Democrats. Now, most studies well, show that a... neither one of them – oh, yeah, okay, good – Um, that neither one of them knows all that much about climate change. So when people publicly acknowledge that they accept climate change or they don't, what they're really saying, I think, they're signaling, you know, I'm a member of that tribe. And I think this can be tracked back to um, Al Gore's film, An Inconvenient Truth, which, which kind of bundled climate science with liberalism, with the Democratic Party. So conservatives and Republicans, you know, they just, the moment they see the word climate science or global warming, their brain autocorrects to liberalism, uh, Democrats, control of the economy and socialism, and, you know, just down the rabbit hole you go. Um, And and so it's, I don't think religion's a good predictor for that unless you want to lump conservative Christian, something like that, but it's a conservative part. I think that's at work there. There was an interesting study done called Political Conservatism, Religion, and Environmental Consumption in the United States. And then what they found is the strength of religious identity and regularly of a religious attendance and religious practices appear to increase environmental friendliness in conservatives. So Hmm. what to quote, they said, we can assert there is no evidence that any of our measures of religiosity intensified the negatives of political conservatives. In fact, they found the opposite. If someone was a conservative and deeply religious, they became more environmentally friendly. Versus someone who's just conservative. Well, that would be nice that if religious. that that would that would be nice if you could uh, if you could package that and, and ship it out there to all those conservative Christian uh, you know Republicans who you know think that climate change is a hoax and so forth. I'm telling you, a lot the, the of way them. forward is just convince them nuclear power and we'll all be on the same page. <laughs> well, uh, you and I would agree on that. <laughs> mm-hmm. I remember a few years ago Ed Wilson tried to capture that idea of con. con- conservatism should also be in favor of conserving the environment and uh, he got he made some headway with some christian groups with that uh, but you know but but po- politics has become so divisive now that it's 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 hard to even have that conversation true next up thank you very much for your question this one coming in from smoky saint says for dr Shermer, was it the bible that instructed the european slave trade to treat africans like animals or was it the evolutionary theory that taught that Africans were lesser evolved than whites? 
Oh, that's that's an easy one. Yeah, no. So evolutionary theory is pretty late in the game. Uh, you know, slavery has been around for thousands of years before Darwin. So I had nothing to do with that. No, it was just kind of this general uh, underlying racism that most groups have about other groups that are different from them. You know, that appears to be this kind of xenophobia of which racism is just a part seems to be built into our nature and for probably for good evolutionary reasons. But, you know, that's a, that's another you know, 10 minutes of, of talking. Uh, I, you know, I, I think it had nothing to do with it. Um, there were social Darwinists who, um, you know, kind of bundled Darwin's theory with the, you know, the kind of traditional racism that was already there and justified it. And, you know, that ended up disastrously in the eugenics movement, uh, which has now been largely discredited, although you can still find in some far right circles, discussions of Darwin and and eugenics, but, you know, they're kind of on the, on the outs now. So anyway, yeah. So I would also add real quickly to that, that um, I can't remember exactly, but I remember hearing it from a lecture by Dr. Joshua Moritz, but the, some of the prominent biographers of Darwin would have noted that he was not no, no he was not, he, he was very much uh, uh, this idea that um, he wanted to use the theory of evolution to show that we're all connected, that we're all one big giant family. He was very much an anti-racist he was an abolitionist. Yes, he, was, he, he protested was, yes, with he the was. abolitionists. He was very much an anti-racist. And so he yeah. was, when he put forward his idea of evolution, he's saying, look, guys, we're all, we're all one big family. Let's not fight. Like, and so, no, the idea of evolution would promote racism. Others would, could take that idea and, and corrupt it, but that doesn't mean Darwin wasn't. In fact, the more you study yeah. the, from the professional historians on Darwin, I mean, you know, he always wasn't a perfect man, but he did do so. A lot of his stuff is taken out of context. Gotcha. And thanks for your question. This one coming in from Jay Mixon, kind of wanting to get get the big picture from the debate set. I'm not hearing this from the Conver. Let me read it uh, from its entirety, just so they said, is either speaker's stance that Christianity is dangerous. I'm not hearing this from the conversation. I'm hearing that Christianity is potentially or contingently dangerous, which is a stance I don't think either would necessarily disagree on. Is that true? Yeah. Agree on that, maybe? Yeah. Well, I mean, I would, I, think so. I mean, contingently, I mean, depends on what we mean. I would say in certain contexts, there have been bad Christians who've done bad things and use Bible verses to justify it. I would make the case that that's not necessarily Christianity causing that. I mean, just because, like I just mentioned with the excuse of evolution, some people can use evolution to promote all sorts of horrible things like uh, that the aboriginals are not as fully evolved as us, therefore it's okay to treat them unfairly. That doesn't mean Darwin was a racist. It doesn't mean Darwinism promotes racism. It just means there's bad people who can take things that exist and use it for however they want. I don't, I don't know that necessarily means that it's the actual uh, worldview or the actual underlying doctrines of something are necessarily evil. we got to be very careful with distinguishing correlation and causation. Gotcha. Thank you very much. James W. for your question said, so we see every day the world becoming more and more secular. Bible prophecy has done nothing but fail. This is more of a lot of this statement, but uh, we'll we'll get to this. Uh, Has done nothing but fail. The God of the gaps is always Mm -hmm. getting smaller and smaller. So now the only place God has to hide is the origin of the universe and origin of life or some alternate dimension. We could never actually access to see he isn't there. What's the end game to Christianity? In 50 years, 100 years, will it be a small vestige of what is today, or will it evolve and stay somewhat relevant longer? So I can say three things on that. First of all, I refer you to the research of um, evolutionary biologist Michael Bloom, who has pointed out that religion isn't going anywhere because it's of its reproductive benefits. Most of the children, uh, he and his work have shown to come from religious families. And so more people secularize, less children they tend to have naturally into societies. So I don't think it's going anywhere. Second thing, prophecy has failed depends on what prophecies. If you would be someone like a futurist, someone who believes in a rapture or whatnot, yeah, it's failed, but I reject that kind of stuff. I am a partial preterist. I think most of what we're talking about in the Olivet Discourse happened in 70 AD, and I'm a post-millennialist. I don't believe there's a future antichrist or tribulation. I believe the world is going to keep getting better, and then that's going to be the millennial kingdom. So I'm very optimistic about the future long term. Most people who were hold to this sort of future problems, they are pre-millennialists. They think Jesus is coming back before the millennial kingdom. I'm a post-millennialist. So I'm more in line with people like Tim Keller or the old preacher Jonathan Edwards. Um, and the final thing of the God of the Gaps argument, well, uh, go over to the Capturing Christianity ch- uh, channel. Uh, I will be debating apostate prophet on God's existence on the 20th for right now, unless there's any more complications. But so stay tuned. You got it. Thanks for that. And <laughs> it's this- interesting. Do you, uh, 
Wait, Go Mike, ahead. Michael, do you think uh, the, the the middle one there that you said, <clears throat> no, the last one, do you think that, uh, you know, when Jesus talked about, you know, heaven or, you know, that what's coming, it's here on earth. He's talking, he's talking about making the world a better place here, not anticipating it's coming in this other world. In other words, it's, you know, heaven is heaven's on earth. This is it. Exactly. Well, that, that's where the, the end goal for Christianity is always the resurrection. And I've, I've, I've talked about on my channel, my eschatological views are that the resurrection will happen and it will be our job to turn earth into Eden and then the whole universe into Eden. So people say, why is there a big universe and not enough life? I say, well, it's going to be there. We just have to start, we just have to get to work. Gotcha. And we yeah, have okay. another question from <laughs> Megan Satanas. Appreciate it. This one, pardon my delay on asking this, Megan, thanks for your patience, said, for Mike Jones, did Jesus not say to uphold the laws of his father and of the Old Testament? I think that it's a reference to a passage in Matthew 5. Yeah, she's talking about Matthew 5, and I talked about it in my passage. So the actual quote is, like, do not think I've come to abolish the law, I've come to fulfill the law. For not one jot or tittle shall pass away until all is fulfilled. And, and so he says there's two until clauses. One is of heaven and earth. One is until all is fulfilled. Um, so certain scholars have noted that the first one, until heaven and earth, is dominated by the second in the Greek grammar. Um, it's more of like saying until hell freezes over, this ain't going to pass away until it's all fulfilled. And so, yeah, he, Jesus upheld and kept the Mosaic law for us because we couldn't and we were imperfect. Uh, that's what Paul's talking about in Romans 3. Uh, we uphold the law through our faith in Christ. So again, John 19, 28 says Jesus bowed his head saying it is finished to fulfill the scriptures and that's why hebrews 8 says it's passing away it's obsolete uh and it was and so and then what do we do we uphold the, the royal law of christ the covenant with christ which is to love one another so no we don't have to keep old testament laws those were fulfilled in christ also with my view of scripture it's progressive uh it's this idea of there was a um, god is gave the mosaic law to people in the ancient bronze age because they were really morally corrupt, but he couldn't give them the perfect law he wanted to give them right away. So God is progressively making us better culture over time. Gotcha. And thank you for your question from Adam, more of a statement. Adam Elvilia says, uh, please share my love with both of the speakers. Also, let Dr. Shermer know I enjoyed his guest appearance at Dr. Roy, I know I'm going to mispronounce this, bear with me. Is it Roy Yazovich? Yazovich's channel, who is an Israeli yeah, theist. Yeah. Hope seeing some more oh, like right, that. Right. Yeah, okay. Well, I'll talk to anybody. <laughs> Excellent. And thanks so much for your question. I just question. want to know it's true. You bet. And thank you for your question. This one coming in from... Oh, by the way, folks, we will always... We will always let people know if there is an after show, no matter what side of the debate they're on. And tonight, Smoky Saint is hosting an after show. And so we will be putting that in the description as well as I think he's been putting it in the chat. And so do want to let you guys know about that. And I'll throw that in the chat in just a moment. James, uh, James the Apologetics is going to have me on, I think, sometime tomorrow for just a post-debate review. You got it. Absolutely. And we're happy to link that as well. So I appreciate that. And so, let me just check. I think there was one question. Forgive me for my delay on this one because it was asked earlier and things have been moving fast. Though this question from comes from Tigera Hitman or Hitman says, question for Dr. Shermer, when is enough scientific evidence enough? And yeah, I suppose that's, uh, they're uh, saying like the, the scientific evidence that Mike Jones had argued for. Right. Okay. That's a great question. Here I would recommend uh, Naomi Oreskes' book instead of one of my own, uh, Why Trust Science at All. Well, it has to do with the kind of consensus amongst experts in a particular field when uh, they have uh, have, have reached a certain level of confidence that the particular hypothesis or theory or claim under examination is probably true. Now, true with a small t, probably because there are no 100% um, conclusions in science. And uh, so how do you know, like, say, since we talked about climate change, well, there's this kind of consensus. People are, have heard this term, the climate consensus. What does that mean? You know, I got this guy over here who says he doesn't believe it, and he's a professional scientist. Well, by consensus, we don't mean every single scientist working accepts it. There's always somebody that doesn't accept it. I, I still hear it occasionally from Big Bang skeptics and or people that don't think I, HIV causes AIDS and so on. There's always, you know, kind of outliers. But at some point, the people working in a particular field 
kind of come to a conclusion through conferences and conversations and peer reviewed journal articles and meta analyses. And, you know, they talk amongst themselves, you know, what do we know? How confident are we? That, and at some point it just kind of reaches a tipping point and it's like, okay, that, that one's pretty much done. Let's move on to the next problem. And uh, that, you know, that sounds kind of messy and, and it is, but it's, it's how science works in a way. If you don't do that uh, with, you know, a lot of research, a lot of studies and a lot of debate, and disputation, you end up with a replication crisis like we've had in the social sciences and the medical uh, sciences, where a lot of these research, major significant research projects uh, or studies are not replicable. When people try to replicate them, they can't. And it looks like maybe half of published, peer-reviewed published papers in respectable journals are probably should have never been published. Okay, so that, that's what I mean. It's a messy process, and you really got to grind through a lot of studies. That's why uh, my, Michael talked about meta analyses. You really got to do that because one or two studies showing this or that, you know, coffee's good, coffee's bad, you, you just can't draw any conclusions from the, these single studies. So that, that's what we mean by that. Gotcha. And thank you very much for this reminder. This one came in from. James W. in Logical, Plausible, Probable, John Maddox said, Amy is also hosting an after show. That will be in less than two hours. So it will be a late night after show at midnight. And so we will add that <laughs> to the description as well for the list of after shows. So stoked that people have got a, gotten a kick out of this. And so I'm going to just quick skim the chat before we do go into the thank yous. In other words, just looking for any last questions and want to say we really do – Oh, that's right. Okay, so we do have someone said that they had one last question on Kickstarter. And I want to say just a quick reminder, folks, that our guests are linked in the description. If you'd like to hear more, if you'd like to read more, you certainly can. And so we'd certainly encourage you to do that. And then two moments while I open up this question. Thank you very much. Oh, Lay, who, by the way, Lay, uh, we appreciate you so much for your support for the Kickstarter as uh, Lay, it must be four in the morning there. So we do appreciate you being a huge fan. And so they had said, my question is with the recent Capitol riot as a clear example, Trump claiming to be Christian, mentioning God and faith in his speeches, knowing he has a large Christian following, this is evidence in favor that Christianity can be used dangerously to help push a negative, dangerous agenda. Wouldn't you agree? And they had said, similar to Nazis wearing the word God with us on their belts, I'm happy for either debater or both to answer this. I mean, yeah, I would not deny it cannot be used. That doesn't mean, I mean, you could twist anything you want to be used for evil. I mean, examples in evolution in the past. Evolution was never intended to be racist. People twisted and turned it into something racist. You can use whatever you want for evil. I don't, would never deny that. Yeah, back to my discussion about what do people really believe something. I don't think most Christians really believe Trump's a Christian. Uh, you know, I think they they kind of went along with it like, yeah, yeah, that's our party's supposed to be religious or whatever. And, you know, I mean, nobody could possibly think he's a serious Christian. It's just not possible. There's zero evidence for that. He just, you know, mouthed the words because he had to get the votes. And I think that's pretty obvious. So and, and the stuff we saw at the Capitol, had, that had nothing to do with religion or Christianity. That That's just, you know, really, it's kind of insanity. But more specifically, believing a falsehood that is. Uh, you know, if you really believed that the Democrats stole the election and your boss says, go over there and do something about it because they're meeting right now, then, you know, that's, that's, that's not completely crazy. You know, they're, you know, they, if, if they really believe that again, it's like the pizza guy, you know, he really thought there was a pedophile ring. He's going to do something about it. Right. So, you know, trying to understand why people do things, uh, and I think it's going to come down to these, you know, false beliefs. By the way, I want to comment, Michael, on um, back to this pragmatic truth that that could apply to some things like, you know, free will or God's existence. Maybe it can never be proved. And, and it's, uh, you know, OK. And it's sort of a pragmatic sense to say I act as if I have free will, even if the determinists have the better arguments, because it works for me. You know, some people make that argument and, you know, that they're. You know, uh, like I have a chapter in my book, um, um, Giving the Devil is Due, on Jordan Peterson, uh, you know, who's a kind of a, a superstar uh, amongst intellectuals who maybe is a Christian, uh, 
but it's not clear, uh, you know, because, you know, he talks about Jesus, uh, you know, bearing his cross and we should all bear our own cross because the world is um, hard and suffering is is common and, and so forth. And so he, there he's speaking kind of metaphorically about the resurrection. But of course, Michael, you you, you would probably not go along with that. You think it, it actually happened empirically. It's true, not just metaphorically or mythically. Right. So there I think that those distinctions matter. Gotcha. And thank you very much for your question. This one coming in. Appreciate it. Evan had asked, given that it is Christian societies which have led to the Enlightenment scientific revolution and the modern secular and scientific ethic, and Christian societies are the most prosperous and among the most secular today, do you think, uh, let's see, and Christian societies are the most prosperous and among the most secular today, do you think it is possible that Christianity is the quote least bad of the world's religions for Dr. Shermer. <laughs> least bad. That's one way to put it. <laughs> I guess that'd be a slight twist on our, on our debate topic. Um, well, I don't think I'd, I'd characterize it quite like that. I mean, you know, the history of science, you know, there's many factors at, at work in what led to uh, say the Copernican revolution and then Newton and, and the enlightenment application of scientific principles to other fields and so on. Um, yes, certain aspects of Christianity were probably better for that than the other religions, at least at the time. Although, as we know, you know, Islam, uh, you know, had a, a very rich uh, scientific um, tradition, you know, in, in centuries past. Um, and, you know, so now the big question amongst uh, Muslim scholars is what went wrong? You know, how did they, you know, kind of lose uh, the civilizational race to modernity when they were ahead? And, you know, in medieval Europe was, you know, basically a backwater swamp. You know, so the answer to that question is very complicated. And, you know, the religious factor is just one of many. Thank you very much. And then I think this is our last question. Joshua, thank you very much for your question, said for Dr. Shermer, G.K. Chesterton said, quote, It was no flock of sheep the Christian shepherd was leading, but a herd of bulls and tigers. Remember that the church went in specifically for dangerous ideas. She was a lion tamer. His point being that Christians are dangerous because humans are dangerous. Christian, Christianity tries to tame the lions. When it fails, who should we call dangerous, the lion tamer or the lion? <laughs> wow. Okay. <laughs> Very interesting. I'll leave it to Chesterton. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's quite the metaphor. Uh, I I don't think I'm buying that. Um, again, I want to. I would want to look at well, what's making people tame their inner demons. Uh, here, I like Steve Pinker's um, book, The uh, Better Angels of Our Nature, where he invokes um, the civilizing process. There's a book called The Civilizing Process. Uh, in which the author tracks um, all the different things that were operating in, in late medieval or early modern Europe um, to keep people from being so violent and from being so you know, crude and, and, uh, and just uh, out of control. And it had to do with self-control, that is, elements in, in uh, society like this, he tracks, uh, this, his name is Elias, um, he tracks these um, books of manners and customs and, you know, how to behave properly all the way down to, you know, you should uh, not use your fork to pick up a piece of meat from the plate and put it in your mouth and then use your fork again, you know, double dipping, so to speak. You know, and, and like hundreds of these rules, like don't urinate in public and, uh, you know, and, 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 and make your bed and, and don't treat people this way and, and, and don't pass gas in front of other people and on and on and on. And so this has nothing to do with religion, but just, just kind of uh, principles of self-control uh, that then trickled, uh, you know, up to the to, to, to kind of high culture and then got passed along through uh, literature and so on. And then we all kind of had our, you know, that all our boats r rose on that tide of, of civilizing behavior, uh, you know, of which religion is one that, that does that, but, but other sources as well. 
Thank you very much. And with that, we are going to jump into the thank yous. Thank you so much, everybody, for making this possible. Thank you so much, Mike Jones and Dr. Michael Shermer, for being here with us today. It's been a true pleasure. And I want to say thank you. Thank you, everybody, for your questions as well. We do have a shout-out thank you list, as we do want to say thank you so much for helping make this event possible. Jay Mixon, appreciate it. Sam Mitchell, Don Fullman, Pete, I want to make sure. Pete, thanks for giving me the spelling of it. Baruby, thank you very much for your support. John Buck, Jason S. Barrios, Jeff Schwartz, Frankie Winters, forgive me, anybody, if I, I mispronounce. Anisim Petriscu, thank you very much. Top Dog Shattuck. Uh, good to see you again, and thank you. Sarah Rodriguez, we appreciate it. Chris Gammon, thank you very much. Paul Kamish, thank you for your patience with my misspelling of that. I appreciate that, Paul. And Adam Albilia, Michael and Amanda, thank you as well. Farron Salas, thank you. Barry Barry, good to see you again as well, and thank you very much for your support. Benjamin, thanks so much. Oliver Catwell, thank you. Trevor A. Stroop, thank you very much for your support. Joshua Alec, Thank you very much. And Smokey Saint, thank you very much for your support. We really do appreciate it, folks, as uh, we really do. We want this channel to be a level playing field for people to make their case, no matter what walk of life they're from. We hope everybody feels like they were treated fairly and they were treated well. And so we really do appreciate our guests who are linked in the description, folks, as I had mentioned. And so we do want to say one last time, thank you very much to the Modern Day Modern Day Debate community for being here with us, being so supportive and buying into that vision of giving everybody an equal platform to make their case on. And so thank you very much for your support in the chat, everybody. And thank you once again. One last thank you to Mike Jones and Dr. Michael Shermer for being with us. Thank you, gentlemen. Good evening. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Take Bye -bye. care, folks. Keep sifting out the reasonable from the unreasonable.